Hi there, friend. My name is John Werner. I used to be a part of the largest cult in the United States. After studying the Bible, Christian history, and ministry, I set my sights on confronting the problematic nature of white evangelicalism in the United States. In 2019, I published my first book as a first step in addressing the subtle issues of this complex system. This podcast will continue that work under the same title. Welcome to The Cult of Christianity. Content warning. While the cult of Christianity often deals with tough subjects regarding religious trauma and other triggering topics, some episodes may be more explicit than others. This episode contains content that may be distressing to some listeners. This may include multiple mentions of self-harm, suicide, sexual abuse, or other intense concepts. Please only listen if you are in the headspace to do so. Take care of yourself. Yesterday was 13 years since I last self-harmed, at least in the traditional usage of the word. I get stuck on the question sometimes, what is self-harm? Because any harm that is self-caused is certainly not as what not what people generally mean. Alcoholism harms the self. Bad eating habits harm the self. Too much money seems to harm the self. Usually people mean physical harm when they use that term. Or do they? Truly, when I used to cut myself, the most harm done was not done to my wrist, but to my mind. But self-harm was a direct means that matched the specific end, hurting myself. Or was that the goal? I used to have a clear-cut answer when folks asked, why did you cut yourself? Automatically, I'd reply, It turned emotional pain physical, so it was easier to manage. I don't know where I learned that phrase, if I did. And it's not inaccurate. It's easier to clean up blood than sort through emotions, especially when you're a teenager. There's a weird sense of comfort in seeing a physical, actual, tangible wound rather than mysterious pushes and pulls from inside. There's also the scientific matter of endorphins. Certain kinds of self-harm release literal pain relievers. In other words, free drugs. And I don't say that lightly. Like drugs, the process was addictive. And it was too much medicine for what I was dealing with. What your body does during an injury is in the spirit of protecting you and keeping you alive. If that's what you need every single time you have a tough emotion, your life will become harder, not easier. So when I said I quit 13 years ago, I kicked a very addictive drug. And there's a reason I say I'm sober from cutting. It's especially bad considering my self-harm experience was during my formative years as a teenager. Think about what drugs can do to a young brain. More than that, I certainly didn't quite understand the science that I do now. Generally, the culture of the late aughts and early tens stigmatized the habit, especially those of us who associated with emo culture. And emo culture was not all guy liner, a day to remember, and my space. In my opinion, it was really none of those things. Real emo culture was intelligent kids who were tired of bullying and abuse and needed a common language to express their pain in an artistic way. And this really isn't that unlike hippies, punks, factions of hip-hop, weebs, or any other groups outside the jocks and normies. Different generations and eras have yielded different outcast groups. But emo culture contained the glorification of self-harm and suicide, and I won't pretend that it did not. Unfortunately, that was also a conservative rage talking point growing up. 
Beware of those emo kids. If they listen to Attack Attack, they might be playing suicide games with their friends. And that kind of rage mongering wasn't helping anyone. The real reason emo culture was a bit different than other outcast groups was there was a very real, very warranted mental health crisis. 9-11 and all the rhetoric that followed had amplified anxieties in new ways. You had MySpace, Zanga, and other blogs and profiles, which made gossip and bullying a 24-7 epidemic. Kids weren't just being made fun of at school. Now their own home wasn't safe. A million other things contributed, but essentially emo culture was a way to say, if the world's going to hate me, I'm going to hate me too. So how did I get involved in emo culture? I mean, I was a nerdy, homeschooled evangelical who liked being silly, was generally liked by adults, and I really loved Jesus. Well, puberty sucks. First rejection sucks. But it sucks worse when you have zero sex education, very little frame of reference for what dating even is, and just general purity culture brainwashing. The first girl I liked wasn't just someone I met at a new church. It was the girl God had called me to marry. Of course, I realized that wasn't exactly how it worked. But my obsession and weirdness that was undeniably creepy and uncomfortable as I went through puberty was properly made fun of. I was homeschooled. No one talked crap about me in the halls of my home. But on screens, I could feel the hatred. And I kind of hated myself. For, for many reasons. I felt like I was perceived as so annoying, and I wanted to be so well-liked. My purpose in life was to be a godly man who had a godly wife and godly children. I was failing in that goal because, as a young teenager, the girl that I thought God wanted me to marry was saying no. So clearly I needed to do something different. And now I was doing this whole masturbation thing. Sometimes just once a week, sometimes multiple times a day. And how evil. I mean, I was confessing to God constantly. But other boys were talking about girls too, so was this normal? Well, The church I went to advocated for courting instead of dating, which, you can't even get into that right now. And thankfully, I had a dad who advised against that garbage and made fun of it and said, no, be normal, date normally. But I don't really remember the first time I cut myself. I do remember crying and praying every time I did. And I do know it was only happening occasionally at first. But I remember at the same time, my youth group was talking about how evil the flesh is and how horrible lust is, how dangerous your own heart is. Everything about my body seemed evil, and I was sick of it. I started contemplating suicide. As my brain was arriving to the point where things needed to be questioned and investigated, it seemed like suicide was the best option. I was 100% sure I would get into heaven and my life was dull at best. My friends thought I was weird and girls thought I was creepy. I was also terrified of telling my parents. They, They were good parents for the most part, but they had gone overboard on punishments before when I had gotten in trouble. They were not safe people at the time, or at least I couldn't see them that way. So maybe I could talk this out with my pastor. Well, unfortunately, his sermons were primarily about shaming everyone who didn't believe in Reformed Covenant theology, especially those parts about how we are totally depraved creatures who had no hope or worth apart from this narrow faith. So I had to figure it out on my own. And I did thanks to Google, the Bible, and my intellect, I figured out that God wants us to live so that we can save more people. In other words, the only reason I shouldn't hate myself is that I should have a Messiah complex. 
But figuring out the solution (laughs) resulted in a bigger problem. I could only feel like a messiah or a wretch. When I felt I was doing good and obeying God, I was superior to everyone. But when I felt I was sinning, i.e. masturbating, feeling jealous, or experiencing any human emotion that my church didn't want me to experience or say was okay, if I felt anything like that, I was inferior to everyone. And those highs and lows were exhausting, to say the least. So the cutting didn't stop, and neither did the suicide ideation. In fact, it made every sin feel like the end of the world, like a detrimental failure. I hated everything I was and everything I did. Because I was now introduced to another theological favorite of the church of my teenage years. Quote, our good works are as filthy rags. Basically, even if we do obey God, we shouldn't take credit or feel good about it because all glory goes to God. So now... I'm in a mindset where I feel shame if I obey God because feeling good about it would be a sin, and I feel shame when I'm not obeying him because I'm totally depraved without him. I am fucking disgusting. As more triggering things happen, including watching videos of suicides and murders online in a very unregulated wild west of an internet, and having loved ones die... And at one point, having a girlfriend who was quite unstable and emotionally abusive, and many other things, self-harm became a daily routine. And pepper in a half-hearted suicide attempt in there somewhere, too. All of this was in secret. I mean, my closest friends knew I cut myself, but some of them were doing the same thing, and... Certainly, we were all kids who never wanted to call the police, which was about the only resource I, at least I had heard about. Eventually, the high ran out, though, so I experimented with other kinds of self-harm. And I won't get as graphic as it was, but none of them felt as good as cutting. Sometimes I was more vocal about it, and sometimes I wasn't. I don't remember... Um, why I stopped cutting, really. But for whatever reason, March 18th, 2010 was the first day of the rest of my life where I said I'm never going to cut again. But I do want to tell one more story, and this one is a bit disturbing, so feel free to skip ahead a couple minutes if you need. I cut myself at church once. Not my home church. It was like a conference for our local presbytery. And me and a group of friends were uh, eating the catering, which was just hot dogs. And my best friend's little brother had a new knife. And by the way, part of being in a conservative culture in the South is most young boys have some kind of knife by like age 10 um, that they carry with them. Uh, But the boys and I (laughs) did not have Swiss Army knives. We had, like, sharp hunting knives. Well, I guess this was this kid's first knife, so he was playing with it a lot. Um, And I was, like, 15-ish at the time, somewhere in there. And I I grabbed it from him, and I held it on top of my self-harm scar. And I had been flirting with a girl from another church who was sitting with us, uh, but she wasn't paying enough attention to me. And I looked at my best friend who was sitting there too, and I went, dare me to do it? And that friend said, sadly, no, because I know that you'll do it. And I looked to the girl who was talking to someone else, and I tapped her on the shoulder with the knife. She looked at me curiously, and I held it up again, and I said, dare me to do it? And she said, do it. And I quickly slashed my wrist twice, and it was deeper than I had ever cut before. And I still remember the look on her face. Horror. Uh, The first and only time I have ever seen that look on another human's face. And my best friend shook their head and reached for some napkins to give me. And it actually hurt again. For the first time in a long time. The cut was probably bad enough that I should have gotten stitches. 
and and I'm I'm really sorry um, for the five teenagers, tweens, or whoever, what other kids were around. Um, they were victims of a traumatic event that I caused, and I made it clear to them that no one was to tell a soul. And it worked out because the napkins being so red, it looked like someone had just cleaned up ketchup from the hot dogs or something. And I held my hand over my wound as it bled. And the girl was very sweet and walked me to, uh, you know, like an empty nursery. And we got a Band-Aid from it. And uh, she asked me why I why I did that. I remember so specifically she asked, are you one of those people we talk about in school who don't feel pain? And I know why she asked that. Um, and I didn't react very strongly, but I lied to her. I said, yeah, I don't feel pain. And she goes, well, I guess that's a good thing, right? And I got a lump in my throat <laughs> just like just now. Um, and I said, it's a great thing. I feel like no one understands me, but at least it doesn't hurt. This would not be the last time in my life I resorted to pretending, really, to be numb. Um, but it was the first time I had viewed um, numbness as as coping. H- here's the obvious fact. I was in pain. So much emotional pain. And frankly, it did hurt when I cut that deep, at least. Well, for whatever reason, my cutting kind of slowed down after that night before I quit cold turkey that following March. And I say that story not for shock value, but to highlight two important observations. That was the only time in my life I cut myself for attention. The accusation that people self-harm for attention, it's not true. It is usually private. Even so, when I did it for attention... That doesn't invalidate the fact that I was clearly going through some real trauma with no real guidance. And the other thing that sticks out in my memory is how the f*** did no one notice in a church fellowship hall with hundreds of people. Remember, this was a conference. It was like 13 churches put together full of hundreds of people. Not one adult realized I was bleeding a lot out of my wrist. Churches are so fucking dangerous for kids. My parents didn't notice, no pastors, nursery workers, kitchen volunteers, or even regular members noticed I cut myself in a church, and no one noticed. Granted, it's not like I wanted them to at the time. And I'm sure I would have played it off as an accident. Oh, I was just playing with my friend's knife, and it slipped, you know. And I don't know how believable that would be due to the size of the wound. But many times, people simply believe what they want to anyways. So why am I talking about this now? You know, I self-harmed 13 years ago. Aren't I over it? Well, the short answer? No. And I never will be. I wish larger society gave a shit about kids who self-harm. I want to believe that things have gotten better since then, and they have in some ways. In other ways, it is not. And I am paranoid about the TikTok generation that that much exposure to not only being talked about, but being pressured to talk about anything and everything. Uh, when I was coming up, we didn't have the same like algorithms and tech moguls. The largest economies weren't vying for every second of our attention. Sure, the less regulation and resources made it hard to know how to get help. And I'm glad there's more uh, resources and easier to find help. But I fear Younger generations won't always know that they need help. They might think a f***ing 15-second video they watch on repeat is help. And it is not their fault. It's on us now. I'm an adult and you are too, presumably, dear listener. What the hell are we doing? Well, we can't fix everything, right? And it's the hardest lesson for me to learn. But I know one thing that I can continue to expose, and that's that churches are even more dangerous than TikTok. You see, in my contained cult, depression could only be a sin, at least logically speaking. Even if there was some wiggle room for medical diagnosis, I didn't go through anything traumatic enough to warrant such a reaction. 
So clearly, it was all in my head. Well, no shit. When you're a Christian, all reality is in your head. But that's besides the point. It's worth noting that my church was a cause of my self-harm. Not the only cause, but one of the primary ones. And hearing that my flesh was evil, at least weekly, is not healthy. Hearing that good works don't really matter is not healthy. Hearing I'm a totally depraved human who has no hope apart from whatever God feels about me is not healthy. Thirteen years ago, I stopped, and not with the help from anyone. Jesus didn't take it from me. I didn't even pretend to believe that at the time. I helped my own damn self. And I'm proud I did. The first year was incredibly difficult. I had to navigate the after effects of being severely emotionally abused as a high schooler by a long-distance girlfriend, only to then find myself in another long-distance relationship, a first relationship of any kind I would make known to my parents. And the band I was in was navigating typical band drama. But I didn't do it again that first year. And the second year... I went through a very difficult breakup, Um, and that's where I felt this call to be a pastor, whatever that means. But when I didn't cut after that painful breakup, I knew I was pretty damn strong. In my third year, I was a freshman at Bible college, fulfilling my call to be a pastor, and I saw all my self-harm as part of my testimony, something I overcame. And while that made it codified in such a way that self-harming was less of an option, I still was battling severe depression and struggling to talk about it openly in that environment. The next year, there was a lot of death of people I knew, and my depression was worse than ever. I wrote an article about the Christian response to suicide and self-harm and published it in my school's academic journal. It was the first time that I was public about my self-harm history. And it was well-received, though initially perceived as controversial, which was kind of weird. Fast forward through my college years, by the time I got married in 2016, I figured it, it, I, it, it'll be easy to be sober, but it wasn't. As life got harder, the urge to self-harm would come back up, ultimately cultivating when I came home to divorce papers in December of 2017. And the fact that I didn't cut that day, the next year, or even the year after, as I faced homelessness, more death, more grief, and the most pain of my own life, being sober from self-harm started to mean something even more. And so I began writing you know, posts on social media about my recovery and saw so many people needed to hear what I had to say. And I stopped viewing it as a mere accomplishment, the personal achievement, but as something that is more of a communal struggle. I think I used to think it was especially taboo and strange, suicide ideation and self-harm. But the older I get, the more I realize it is a cultural infection. And by the time this episode is out, I will probably write a lot about this, either for social media or for news. But I want to explore this more in context and, of course, explain the severity of the cult's influence on the topic. But first, what does year 13 of sobriety feel like? Honestly, it feels like surviving a war, not just battles. Um, It finally is starting to feel like I've really won. It's scary. Part of the sobriety framework is understanding the daily nature of fighting against an old habit. Also, that was not the last day I had suicide ideation. Not sure if I've ever made it a year without that. Even further, I've been a bit all over the map there. (laughs) Some years it's a rare fleeting thought, uh, others it's a cloud overhead constantly, and some nights it's rather scary, Um, and sometimes I joke about it. It's weird. So by celebrating my victory in the self-harm department, I'm not acting like I've overcome something I haven't. Uh, Also, I've had other self-harming vices. You know, earlier I mentioned alcoholism and bad eating habits. Uh, While my bout with liquor seems to have been a one-summer fling, I am still quite fearful sometimes of my drinking, trying to sort out what is a problem and what's left over 
you know, from being a Christian critic, you know, that, that can be tough, but I am confidently not dependent on alcohol anymore. Uh, so she can hang around for now, but bad eating habits, you know, based on mood, that certainly happens with me. Um, though typically I'm, I'm fairly healthy. Um, I'm still want to be mindful about how I'm treating my body. And finally, I, I just try to survive, especially financially. I'm sure I could refine my spending habits in a way that would benefit me more long term. I'm not sabotaging with retail therapy. Um, you know, I'm just betting on myself with an expensive school, really. And while it might seem risky, it's a good bet. I'm confident in what I can do with my degree. All this to say, March 18th, 2010 isn't the date I became healthy. It's not even the date I became a better person. Really, I could argue it's a rather insignificant plot point, taking in all of who I am versus who I was. But it's not insignificant. Mental health is a complex topic, and isolating one element is not wrong. If I celebrate, I no longer have a broken leg, it doesn't mean I'm neglecting the rest of my body. I still have things I need to do to keep the whole thing in shape. But 13 years of not cutting is impressive. And if you've been sober from anything for one year or 20, I feel solidarity with you. I believe with all my heart in hope. There's a reason at the end of every episode I say, keep love in your life, hope in your heart, and searching in your soul. For one... These are things that I've had my whole life through the ups and downs, through conversion to Christianity, to deconverting, through being proud and ashamed of who I am. Love must be in your life. Ideally, you'll be giving that love to many and receiving it from many. But sometimes it's only going one way. And you know what? Temporarily, that's okay. If you don't have much to give, make sure you're getting it. And if you're not getting much, please keep giving it. You need love in your life. Hope in your heart is a hard one for me. Always has been. I'm cynical, even pessimistic, often. But that hope that I can get better, whatever better means, and others can find the love they lost and give the love they don't have that continues to put a smile on my face. So I hope in your heart can save you from quite a lot. And searching in your soul. Do I believe in a soul? I don't know. Uh, it depends on how the word is used. I do think that there is an unobservable, indescribable, unique essence of each individual that goes beyond the material. The intellectual pursuit of information is wonderful, but I'm not convinced it's for everyone. What is for everyone is is to never be stagnant in the evolution of who they are. Searching in your soul means that you should never stop trying to become the you that you feel destined to be. Am I mentally healthy? Well, I mentally work out. <laughs> I mentally diet. And I mentally see the mind doctors as necessary. So maybe... Am I mentally sick? Well, I'm chronically fatigued mentally. My mind occasionally wants to eat itself. And I can't cry as much as I need to. So maybe. When larger society talks about mental health, I find there are helpful frameworks for many, but they're not always universal. And there are frameworks that seem universally harmful. There's a medical framework, right? And it is medical in the sense that you and I have physical brains that can develop and have always had little defects. And sometimes those defects just make you a little quirky, uh, but sometimes they are so severe that they can affect your ability to function. People with more expertise than me are better specialized and equipped to address that. Um, and the medical framework can be life-saving for many and it is universal in the sense that it's always healthy to explore what's going on in your physical brain. Where I get hung up on that framework is that people use terms that have um, pretty rigid medical definitions as if it's a personality trait. 
For instance, depression can certainly be used in a non-medical sense as a term and is one of the few conditions I think can be quite easily self-diagnosed. Um, though some do think they are depressed when an anxiety diagnosis might actually be more useful. And there's a difference there. And less familiar folk might just confuse anxiety and depression. And that's okay. However, if you'd like to call yourself something like autistic, that's worth like having a brain scan and like medical professionals address. Not because it's going to flash the words, you've got autism in neon on the MRI picture, but there are medical approaches that can help identify that particular challenge in your brain. And so having symptoms of autism is not autism. Just like symptoms of COVID does not mean you have COVID. Medical frameworks require medical procedures. Now, let me be very clear. In our current condition, the U.S. has a large accessibility and affordability issue with healthcare. That's why there are probably some other frameworks that might be helpful for some. So let's enter the discussion of trauma. Are we all traumatized by our lives? Maybe. I mean, my disposition would be to say yes, absolutely, though the intensity of that trauma will range based on coping ability, personality, genetics, and a million factors. All humans will experience trauma. That's my my gut. But I'd argue that that's just a framework that works for me and many others. I'm not sure that it's universal. Again, that's slightly different than how the medical community uses that word. Even in psychology, there is not a universal standard for how the word trauma is used, even among the majority of therapists. You might see an article that says the three types of trauma or the seven types of trauma or whatever. But to me, I just hear the five love languages or the 16 personality types, you know, Uh, and I don't want to disrespect those in the mental health field because they do really important work. But sometimes the science they rely on is a bit spotty and more based in opinion, narratives and frameworks doesn't make it bad, but it keeps it from being gospel. And that's really my biggest point in all of this. Therapists are much more trustworthy than pastors, but there's obviously bad examples of each. Systemically, mental health support is limited in its healing abilities if it has a relationship with capitalism, and as of right now, it must. And at lower levels, it falls into the trap of selling solutions that don't work as advertised. Therapists deserve to be paid and paid well, but it's a cluster of economic factors that have made the mental health industry leaders see it as an opportunity for cash flow. I want to say one thing very clearly. Get help when you need it. The problems I'm dissecting here are not in the spirit of discouraging necessary things. It's more in the spirit of the frustration with living with mental health issues, not just for me, but people I deeply care about. Between liability issues and impossible demands put on mental health professionals, there's a shadow of feelings that seem unmentionable and unmanageable, suicide ideation being a huge one. Further, so many people have been brainwashed into believing the stigma of having mental health issues. Sometimes the frameworks, word choices, and demeanors of mental health experts put off such people. It's almost... Like the only people who can seek help are those who need it a bit less. And I have no solution. I think things will get better. I I hope all my listeners who want therapy can afford it and find a good therapist who's a great fit for their needs. But I have a deeper hope. I hope we find a way to talk about this stuff less clinically. And I, I hope we somehow can create more honest and vulnerable societies. I dream of a world where lawsuits aren't top of every business's mind because they become so rare. I dream of a world where the rich stop being so goddamn rich and use our finite resources to create a safer, more fun world instead of capitalizing on the pain of everyone beneath them. But until then, I'd say my mental health is pretty good. I've put myself in a good position. I do work that is incredibly taxing emotionally, and I still find new flaws every few months that I need to work on, and I work on them. And my ideation of my life ending still hangs out with me every now and then. It's not my favorite, but it's never permanent. I'm not scared of therapy, saying I've been to therapy, or encouraging others to try therapy. 
I do feel very lonely very often and push through it in ways that aren't toxic. I find myself to be a good friend who sacrifices in healthy ways but still puts up boundaries that are firm, confident, and healthy for me. I feel likable to the people I want to be likable for and unlikable to those I don't really care for. I don't hate my body. I don't hate myself. I love the work I do. I'm still trying to love who I am. Above all, I haven't given up. I haven't even wanted to give up. I've certainly survived more than thrived in my life, but I'm hungry for the next chapter and the next step. But dear listener, I'll never forget where I started. It was f***ing dark, and the hopelessness was as real as the computer I'm recording this on. The memories of that cold, dark mindset do get fainter visually, but never emotionally, at least not yet. I can still hear, smell, and taste that pain, even when it's blurry and less prickly. I will always have the sense that things can hurt. But I am so thankful for that empathy, because I want so desperately for those in emotional pain to know there is love out there. There is hope right here. You're not alone. Sometimes it's a little annoying. It's fun to indulge the myth that we're on an island, a ragged protagonist who must do the impossible to survive. I'll assure you, you are that badass, but you are not that abandoned. I don't have advice, and if I do, it's not super compelling. I'm better at squawking about systemic problems than offering tangible solutions. Really, the only affirmation I feel like giving as my 13 years sober nugget of wisdom is this. You're not crazy. I mean, at least I hope not. We're all a little bit crazy on occasion, and some people get a little infatuated with their delusions. And they can be annoying, and we all know someone like that. But your pain, your pain does not make you crazy. The darkness is not your fault. Your surviving is impressive. And whatever negative self-talk is your go-to right now, the people who love you disagree. Go ask them about it. And if they do agree with your negative self-talk, evaluate who's in your life. The external and internal are always worth evaluating. But you're not crazy for feeling pain, sadness, having a mental illness, or anything else. You are human. And since you are human, I want you to keep that love, that hope, and that searching. And if you're in a cult, I'm suspicious that they don't want the same. I sometimes wonder if I make Christians too big a villain in my work. I mean, I've seen a lot of harm, but come on, Christianity helps some people, right? I had a specific experience, but surely I can't extrapolate it as a systemic problem. Isn't that irresponsible? And I'm not being rhetorical here. I truly do evaluate these questions often. I do get rather paranoid about my choices to call Christianity out in such public and certain terms. What if I've got this wrong? I'm glad that I keep asking those questions. It shows I still have an open mind. Here are the two answers that consistently keep me doing the work I do. First, those questions delight those cult leaders too much. If I said to your average evangelical pastor, or really any pastor, that I have these questions, they'd be salivating to get me back into their doors. And for me, that confirms the predatory nature of it all, as well as a lack of true interest in my well-being. Secondly, any positive done by Christians does not seem to flow from an outworking of that faith. When churches help the community, It doesn't truly seem to be because the Bible tells them so. For one, they don't do anything like what the Bible says, including they all have possessions. That's one thing, top of mind. And most stories of quote-unquote good churches are just stories about what makes a good community. There's nothing special about Christian ones. There's also another answer to my paranoia about doing something wrong by calling out Christians. And that's the amount of harm allowed in their system. 
When I critique capitalism, I'm not saying capitalism never produces anything good. I'm saying look at the exploitation possible and how much practically happens. My critiques of communism follow the same pattern, as do my critiques of anti-theism, the mental health industry, journalism, politics, and everything. But for some reason, when I do that same thing with Christianity, I'm not only met with rage from the extremist, but even the moderates slip into denial. Well, it's not that bad. Or, Christianity is a large umbrella, and you make sweeping generalizations. Okay, noted. But could just one person, aside from those in my similar ideological bubble, just say, it's f*** up that a church can make someone want to contemplate suicide? So often, when I share my story of self-harm, which I do less and less these days, I met with, that sounds hard. I'm sorry the church didn't help you more. Didn't help? No. I'm saying they were a primary or at least significant cause of the mindset that made me hate myself. Frankly, churches that don't make people hate themselves kind of confuse me. Now, part of that is certainly because of the specific church environment I was exposed to, but that certain environment is a cult that took the Bible seriously and scholarly, adhered to fundamental tenets of the Christian faith, and were not moral monsters, but average Joes who walk among us. So, if a progressive church lines up with my ideology of love, hope, and searching, and encourages vulnerable conversations and exploration, I still don't fucking trust them. And it feels so reductive that many think that this is all just a simple trauma response. And I'm not going to deny my trauma, but I am so much more than my trauma. Why does anyone need a church? Community? Great. Let's work on creating irreligious, safe communities. Well, my church is great because... dot dot dot. I've stopped caring. Because all a cult leader has to do is have one problematic view, call it God's, and a whole community gets brainwashed. Cults are so dangerous. And to be clear, I'm not anti-Christian, but I am anti-church. Your personal beliefs are great, but they should not be regulated by people who believe in incorrect and malicious propaganda. And my anger might be off-putting, but I feel the rage for any 15-year-old boy who might be feeling what I felt sitting in church. That hatred for myself, hopelessness for an answer, and, and resigned to accept that I merely exist because of some God. You know why I exist? I exist because I didn't kill myself when I wanted to. Christianity didn't just develop into a cult. It started as one. Kyle Smith, an associate professor and director of the History of Religions program at the University of Toronto, recently published his book, Cult of the Dead, A Brief History of Christianity. Quote, Christianity is a cult of the dead, and the story of its obsession with martyrdom and the remains of the dead begins with the cross. That's how the introduction of his book boldly opens. He then builds a case that the way the Gospels are written, edited, and translated shows an obsession with death and martyrdom among the first Christians. Quote, If much more in theory than ever in actual fact, sanctity was to be found in following Jesus down just such a tapered path. If his life was to be imitated, why not his death? End quote. Early common era history consisted of many suicide cults. While that is certainly far off from... American evangelicalism, in some sense, there is a striking similar fact. Your life is not as important as their belief system. The rhetoric doesn't always sound this way. The less Calvinistic churches might say, you are a one-time publication of the author of the universe, or God created you to do what only you can do, or maybe even, no one could ever replace you, and no one knows that better than Jesus. Sounds great, but they don't mean it gun to your head, if they are asked to renounce their faith, they won't do it. They wouldn't even lie to save your life. And why is that seen as okay? No one's spiritual beliefs about the universe, afterlife, or a collection of Jewish literature reimagined, reinterpreted, and edited by hundreds should be more valuable than anyone's life. But that is exactly what Christianity demands. And there's no correcting me here. 
A modification to Christianity that wouldn't demand something like that would look more like Unitarian or Universalist or, frankly, blasphemies. I want to clarify here. I want the church to be more progressive. I want them to be more loving, hopeful, and open-minded. I believe churches like that probably exist. I don't trust them, but I do applaud their efforts. My mistrust is much less about intentions and more about the power dynamics I find inherent to the belief system. I'll clarify further. There are some religions and cults that I think can be even more progressive at best and even more horrifying at worst than Christianity. I'm not trying to pick on Christians just for fun. But my experience, studies, and profound exploration of these ideas have thoroughly convinced me that a healthy mentality is not possible in the cult of Christianity. And it's all relative, of course. People can negotiate their faith with their communities to create something healthy for their own minds. And I'm not a mental health expert, so I gleefully disclose all of this as opinion. But the opinion is bold and strongly held. Your mental health sucks if you're in a cult. In fact, the more you question a cult, the more I suspect you're progressing. Exvangelicals sometimes seem quite mentally unwell because they've stopped questioning things and have just accepted a different ideology. The bookish Christians who aren't afraid of philosophy opposing opinions and perhaps most important, non-Christians, tend to be healthier than the ones who just say Jesus over and over again. But the fatal flaw I find is that subservience, it seems so inevitable. Just because it's a spectrum of submission does not mean, in my worldview, that it's okay. I'm not concerned with churches at the point of making you bow literally. I have a problem with that mental posture. It's directly opposed to freedom. Like, the idea that freedom in Christ exists is laughable because it requires being a slave of his. And that might sound offensive, and I agree. But this is rhetoric that is either essential to Christianity or it's being intentionally avoided, neither of which is an honest view of loving someone. There is no shame on the individual here. There is also no shame in being mentally unwell, at least in my view. Hell, I don't even really want to harp on shaming cult leaders too much, though I wish they'd understand the intense levels of harm they cause. I want to be accurate. And the dynamic of a leader and a follower, whether that dynamic is denied or transparent, is a recipe for disaster. I'm sure there is some interpersonal relationships where that dynamic can be negotiated to be healthy, maybe on the football field or in a kinky way in the bedroom. But Christianity doesn't afford many options when it comes to negotiation. For starters, Christianity necessarily requires the indoctrination of children who cannot consent to the faith being taught. While some families might create a home where there is minimal indoctrination, churches have no choice. They must indoctrinate. Beyond that, Christianity without scriptural authority is no Christianity. Different denominations do different things with how they treat the authority of scripture, but ultimately, they must accept it as a holy book. It's got too many problematic teachings in it for that to be a good idea. If there's any leadership, and I've yet to stumble upon any version of Christianity that doesn't have leadership, there's a necessary implication that any authority is divinely appointed. Of course, evangelicals and reformers can lean into the that for more nefarious purposes, as well as the Catholic Church. But even the simple act of prayer for the congregation subconsciously places the pastor as having superpowers. And I make these points in good faith. I don't know how often leaders and followers in cults are really aware that this is happening. These dynamics are also not always used for immoral acts, but the dynamic seems unhealthy for the mind. Think about how often psychologists are preoccupied with how a child perceived their parent. Your first authority figure will influence so much of your brain formation. Well, most Christians end up placing their pastor or church leaders as their authority figures. 
Children will recognize that, so sometimes the psychological impact compounds the more pastors and church leaders a kid is exposed to. But even without that, relatively good parents can still irreparably do damage to a child they love with one mistake. That's ignoring particularly abusive parents. So in church, the same thing can happen. Now, no one is advocating that we end parental relationships because there can be unhealth. So why do I encourage leaving cults? Because a pastor has no capacity to love you in a non-Christian way. The dynamic is predicated on faith. That's their job. There are probably exceptions to this rule. If you have a pastor who has loved you deeply, done good things for you, or has cared for your family more than anyone, I don't want to take that away from you. But I don't think there's anything wrong with being suspicious of that perception. I can't make a ruling for other people's relationships. That's up to them. But I've had pastors who were really good at convincing me they loved me. I was good at convincing people my faith was the cause of my love. But both those things were lies. I said this in my first mental health monologue way back in season one, and I still believe it. For some, Christianity is necessary for their personal mental health, and for some, it's not. But I do want to expand on that in this way. Obviously, it was quite damaging for me and countless others. I can still acknowledge that my story is not everyone's. But whatever help Christianity is offering people, I am just so passionate that there are other options worth exploring. Everyone, especially myself included, gets comfortable with what works for us. And there's nothing wrong with just letting yourself function. But the ins and outs of Christianity seem to create a need for their cult. They want you to need them to function. And if you're okay with that, great. But I could never be. I used to feel more sympathy because I used to reminisce about the hope I felt when I was a Christian. And it's still true in some ways that I feel less hopeful. I miss the idea of heaven. I miss singing encouraging songs with other people. And I miss the comfort of talking to Jesus at the end of the day. And if anyone out there still needs those things... I'm in no rush to take them away. But I promise, I still have hope in my heart. And most beautiful of all, I put it there myself. No one told me I had to have it there. No one manipulated me into thinking I could only have it if I believe very specific things. And I don't have to feel ashamed when some days I'm less hopeful than others. My own mind is a weird thing. And yours probably is too. I love how weird humans are. I love strange nonsense as well as beautiful poetry and even occasionally a logical thought. I just really hate it when that's suppressed and evangelicalism suppresses it without a doubt. And I encourage everyone to evaluate anything in their life that could structurally remove the uniqueness of you. Be encouraged in this. My sobriety has made me stronger. My leaving a cult has made me braver. And my ongoing journey has made me more loving. Bitterness from trauma and hatred of abusive systems aside, I like who I'm becoming. And I feel freer than I ever have. I want that for all of you. I'm going to end with something I've never said publicly. I've never said it out loud, and it might be a lie. It might be the truth, but I'm going to try it on. Because I really don't care. The truth is, I want us all to be able to say this eventually. I know I couldn't say it when I was inside the cult of Christianity, but I'm free to say it now. I might never say it again. Or I might start saying this often. But I'm going to do it. I've heard it's good for mental health. And my sincere hope is that you can say it with me. Either right now, right after, and if not today, someday. And I'm going to cringe when I say it. (laughs) And you might too. 
but my heart is telling me to, and I'm going to listen to it. So thanks for listening so far. And I hope as hard as these things can be to talk about and listen to, we all make great strides or at least just survive a little longer. Take care of yourself. And for me, I love myself. If you'd like to learn more about this podcast or other work I'm doing, go to thecultofchristianity.com. If you'd like to support this podcast, listen, follow, share, and consider subscribing for $5 through Spotify for additional content, or give as much or as little as you can to support this work through links in the show's notes. Every dollar helps further this important discussion as well as start other exciting projects. Thanks for listening, and remember to keep love in your life, hope in your heart, and searching in your soul.